Okay, we are going to be reading in Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, and um, all the former lessons are on my website, jmtour.com, and they're also transferred to iTunes and, and uh, Spotify, I think, and a bunch of different platforms. So you could you could catch up <clears throat> on all the past ones if you'd want want to. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to be reading from Romans chapter seven, verse one. Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve... in the newness of the spirit <clears throat> and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind, for apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it it killed me. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Therefore, did that which was good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin by effecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. Okay, well, what does that mean? Let's go through it. All right, in verse 1, it says, Or do you not know, brethren, I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. When a person is dead, the laws no longer apply. If a dead person is driving a car too fast, beyond the speed limit, they're not held responsible for that. By law, these only apply to living people. And, and, uh, because dead people generally don't commit many crimes. You go to a, uh, you go to a graveyard, there's not a whole lot of crimes being committed there by the, by the residents of that graveyard. And, and, uh, and so he, he's saying that, that, uh, um, the law has jurisdiction as long as a person is alive. And then what he does is he appeals to the law of that day, which was the, the, the Mosaic law. Under Mosaic law, a man could divorce a woman, but a woman could not divorce a man. That is the law of Moses that was given by Moses a long time ago. And uh, But what's interesting about that today, if you were to go to Israel today among the Orthodox Jews, it's the same way. The man can divorce the woman, the woman cannot divorce the man. But it's not just among the Orthodox Jews. It is also Israeli law. So if you had been, if you've been married in Israel, in a Jewish wedding, the woman to this day cannot divorce the man, the man can divorce the woman. And I know that because I asked some Israelis this week, is this law still in effect in Israel? They said, if you've been married in a Jewish wedding in Israel, that is the law. If you're married in a Christian wedding, it is different. So they look at the the how you were married, and then it's under that that, that the laws in Israel are are still in force. I said, well, what if a man is just like a crumb? I mean, he doesn't take care of his family and doesn't do it. He says, there's a lot of pressure upon him to divorce his wife then, so that she can then be granted the divorce, and the courts can apply pressure to the man. 
but the man has to ultimately grant that even to this day. So he's appealing to the law that we have trouble understanding, but in Israel today, they have no trouble understanding this. And so he says that, that, but once the man dies, the woman is free to marry. In fact, she's encouraged to marry. And so he's using this as an analogy that we have been co-crucified with Christ. That's what he talked about in chapter 6. And we've been co-resurrected with Christ. So when we, when he died, in God's eyes, we died with him, if you be in Christ. When he was raised from the dead, we have been raised from the dead in the eyes of God. And he says, so now you are no longer under the jurisdiction of the law. You can commit yourself back to that jurisdiction if you want to. But you're no longer absolutely under it. And, and so, so, uh, you can, you can go back under it. And that's one of the problems that we have. So if you look now in verse four, therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. So you, you see that, that, um, uh, here he says that we were resurrected with him. That's Jesus in order that we might bear fruit for God. Why were we resurrected with him? Well, one of the reasons was it's not just to make us feel good. Not just for our ultimate salvation. It is in order to bear fruit for God. So this is one of the reasons why Jesus has been risen from the dead. In order to, to uh, um, uh, uh, bear fruit for God. And we see this in other places. So, for example, in Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through through 14, Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, you know, in the New American Standard, this is all one sentence that I'm about to read. This is like a, a, a huge sentence, but listen to this. Titus chapter 2, verse 11, for, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. He did this to make us also zealous for good deeds. This is part of being a believer in Christ. We are to be zealous for good deeds. You know what that means? It means that we don't just sit around waiting for the possibility of a good deed to, here's a chance for a good deed. It's hit me in the face. Maybe I will do that. No, we are to be zealous. We are to be active in good deeds. That is part of why he saved us. Hear me in this. Be active in good deeds. I encourage you, if you're on, on campus, that you be zealous for good deeds that you be zealous for good deeds, that these good deeds come and we, you be zealous for them, that we, we uh, uh, be enthusiastic about good deeds. That's part of the, part of the, the reason that he came and, and we were resurrected. Now in verse 5 of, of Romans chapter 7, For while you were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. And oh, do we know that. You know, that, that we see that... that uh, um, there are sinful passions that are aroused by the law. But the Bible says it's all these rules and res- regulations that do this. But now you have been released from the law, having died to that by which you were bound. Here's an important point. So that we serve, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. You know, this is, this is like one of the bottom line summations of this. We serve not because of the commandment in itself, but because of the newness in the Spirit. We serve because we love. We serve not because we are trying to get approval. So chapter 6 was about this whole idea of justification. We have been justified not by works, but by faith. If you're a believer, you've heard this many times. You're saved not through works, but through faith. Yeah, I got it. Most people get it. We're saved not by works. There's nothing that we can do to get salvation. We. This is a gift from God. This is a free gift. <clears throat> the next phase of this is something called sanctification. This means where we are today, service to the Lord. 
And there is a common element that is wrong, but is common among every believer has had a struggle with this. And if, you, if you say you've not struggled with it, I don't believe you. Or you may not be real with yourself. That, that I'm sure that if I spoke with you for 10 minutes, I can show you where you have struggled with this. And that is not that it, it's not a matter of being justified by faith, not by works. It's a matter of being acceptable to God through your faith and not through your works. This whole idea of sanctification. This is what he's dealing with in this chapter. Chapter 6 was about justification. I am justified by faith and not by works. Well, how about my approval with God? How do I keep God to be happy with me? To be approved by God? Oh, it must be if I just do lots of things, if I get really active. And Paul said, "Mm mm-mm. You try it that way, you're going to get burned out and you'll be defeated. Even victory over sin, it's all based, it says, in the newness of the Spirit. And we're going to go through this in detail. You'll you'll understand this more by the time we get done. Maybe not this week, but next week. Um, that, That this whole newness of the Spirit, this whole thing that comes by newness of the Spirit... So, for example, we, we just had our grandchildren visiting for the last one month. They're, they're gone now, but they were visiting, and we don't get to see them much because they live in Israel, and it's been almost two years since we had seen them before because of this whole COVID thing. And my younger granddaughter, she loves to have a little bowl of cereal in the morning because she gets a very big breakfast when Shireen comes down and starts cooking breakfast for them. But... So what I do is I, I mix all sorts of different cereals together she likes and then I put you know sliced almonds on there and raisins and coconut and but why do I do this? Do I do it because I have to do it? No, I don't have to do it. Why why would I take the time early in the morning to do because you know she gets up like four in the morning and comes down. And, and, uh, you know, they're a bit jet lagged, but she just loves rising up early. I was the same way when I was a kid. And, and so I understand this. And, uh, uh, so she comes, comes down. But I do it because I love it. I just love to do it. This is a service that I do for my granddaughter, and I just love it. And when I see her eating it, you know, I put granola in there, and I say, this is rocks. Do you like rocks? She says, yeah, I like rocks. And, and, uh, uh, and so we have this little thing going. But I do this because I love her. It's not because I have to do it. Nobody's making me do this. When we learn that our service to the Lord is we are doing this because we love Jesus so much, that's what makes the difference. We love Jesus so much, that's what makes the difference now. Because we love Him so much. And this is what he's getting at. This whole idea of keeping the commandments of God. I do it not out of obligation, but out of love. You know, I've read of of some of the patriarchs, how they would have these lists for themselves. I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. Then I read that and I thought, man, you must have a very hard life of defeat all the time. This is exactly what Paul is getting at. We have a tendency for sanctification for my approval today with God must be that I serve Him and obey each one of His commandments out of an obligation. And Paul is now teaching us in this chapter, if you try to overcome sin, if you try to obey the commandments in the Bible, and we're not under any of the Mosaic Law commandments, all 613, we're not even under the Ten Commandments. And you go, no, those are part of the Mosaic Law. Jesus fulfilled them. Now, we are under the laws, we are under the commandments of Jesus and the commandments of the apostles in the New Testament. The apostles' commandments in the New Testament, there's over 150 of them and they'll keep us busy. Nine of the ten command, of the ten commandments, nine of them are embodied in New Testament commandments. So it's for that reason we are obliged to keep them. The one that's not there is the one regarding the Sabbath day. And you say, well, well, we're supposed to, you know, we should be in church on Sunday. I'm not going to argue with that. But what I'm saying is that that's not the Sabbath day. Today, Sunday, is not the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day was from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. That's the Sabbath day. So if you didn't rest from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, you are guilty of violating 
the Sabbath. Isn't it a good thing you're not under that one of the Ten Commandments? Because that'd be a real problem. So, we're not under any of them. But he says, if you try to follow these things, if you try to obey these things, you're going to fail. And that's what he's going to go through with us. And what I love about this is this is my life. This is, this, this is a picture of Jim Tour. I have tried to obey the commandments of God and failed and failed and failed and failed. And what we're going to see is Paul is going to talk about his own experience where there was a season in his life where he tried to obey and he also failed. So he says in verse 7 of Romans chapter 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting had the law said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. So so the law will never avail. Never avail for justification, for salvation. Never avail for sanctification. Uh, We've died to this. So he says, so is the law bad? Is the law therefore bad? And and, uh, um, it it says that... that, that, um, Concerning the law, well, what, what's the purpose of the law? He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? He says, no way. May it never be. The strongest words of, in Greek, negation, may it never be. He's saying that the law is not bad. On the contrary, I wouldn't have known what coveting is if the law said, do not covet. The same thing happened to me on the day when the gospel was first presented to me. On that day, when the gospel was first presented to me, the young man had me read for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And I read that and I said, I'm not a sinner. He looked at me. I came from a Jewish home. I thought sin, you had to kill somebody. Or you had to, you know, you know, rob a bank or something. And I said to him, I never killed anybody. I never robbed a bank. How could I be a sinner? Then he turned to Matthew 5.28. And Jesus said, if anyone looks at a woman with lust for her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And it was like, gulp. I mean, that really hit me. Because I didn't know how to look at a woman any other way. I mean, that, that's I, it was so trained in me. I didn't know I was violating anything until I read that in the Bible. I didn't know it was a violation. So the Bible exposes for us what sin is. This is one of the purposes of the law, is to expose to us what sin is. To show us what sin is. That's what it's talking about in verse 7. Paul says of himself, I didn't know what coveting was until I read it. And it says, you shall not covet. So in other words, and in the Old Testament, Paul was under the law in that sense. And he says, and you shall not cover your neighbor's wife. You shall not cover your your, your neighbor's house, his his donkey and his his male servant, his female servant. In other words, you're not supposed to be coveting, desiring the things that your neighbors have, your neighbor has. You're not supposed to not desire your neighbor's wife. You're not supposed to desire your neighbor's house, your neighbor's car. He says, I didn't know that until I read it. So what's the purpose of the law? One of the purposes of the law is that to show you what sin is, to show us what sin is. The law has four purposes and it's going to tell us throughout this chapter. The second purpose is the law is there to make us sin more. You go, what? I don't believe that. Give me a minute. All right. But the law is there to make us sin more. Verses 8 through 11 are going to talk about this. The law makes us sin more. The, uh, uh, the third thing the law does is it drives me to see that I can do nothing to make me acceptable to God. There's nothing that I can do. There's no work that I can do to make me acceptable to God. And that's going to be in verses 12 through 25. And the fourth thing the law does is to drive me to utter faith. The fourth thing the law does is to drive me to utter faith. And that's in chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. That's what the law does. He says the law is not, there's nothing wrong with the law. The problem is me. The problem is me. It's what the law had to work with. Us. That's the problem. And that's what he says here. He says, he says, is the law sin? No way in verse 7. And then he says in verse 8, when I, when I read about coveting, he says, but sin taking opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind. 
For apart from the law, sin is dead. He says, before I, I had this law, I didn't know I was coveting, and now I'm coveting everything. I mean, Paul really struggled with coveting. He says, I was coveting all sorts of stuff. He's revealing something about himself. Last week, I revealed things about myself, my physical struggles, things that I had in life. You have struggles in life. And did you know, when you become a believer in Jesus Christ, you become a lot more aware of your own sin. Before I became a believer, I thought I was a pretty good guy. I was pretty good. I'm all right. You know, if God got me, he'd be getting something pretty good. And then when you become a believer, everything changes. Because you see yourself in the light of God's righteousness and you go, Whoa, I'm a mess. This is the struggle that I have. This is the struggle that every believer has had. If you say you haven't had it, I don't believe you. You're not being honest with yourself. Every believer has this, and they go through this seasons in their life. It's not like you had it and you're done with it. This struggle like, I don't, I don't know that I can, I can even do this. This is too much. I mean, I'm just so wicked. I mean, like every thought that goes through my mind is wickedness. And, and, uh, unbelievers don't have this struggle. It's because you're a believer that you have this struggle. So the testimony that you have this struggle, that I'm not what I'm supposed to be, that I have these thoughts, that I have these actions, that I say things that I never should have said, that I sent this email that I never should have sent, that I sent this text message that I never should have sent, that's a testimony that I'm not where I'm supposed to be. The unbeliever doesn't have that struggle like believers do. This is an indication that you're saved. Not an indication that you're not saved. It's an indication that you're saved. Because the unbeliever doesn't have this struggle. Verse 9. He says, I once lived apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And in in fact, it says, I once lived apart from law. But when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And the commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result death, to, to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So he says in verse 9, But I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. This is a confession by Paul the Apostle. This is not my view of what he's writing here. Messianic scholars. So generally what I will study to prepare for this, I will study Messianic scholars. These are, these are Jews who believe Jesus is the Messiah, so that I can always teach from a Jewish perspective. And, and, uh, uh, because this is what the first century, uh, 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 apostles were teaching from, from their own Jewish perspective. He says, I was once alive apart from the law. When was Paul alive but apart from the law? He was born under the law. He was born a Jew. He was born under the law. When was he alive apart from the law? Well, we know when he got saved on that road to Damascus, he got saved. We know that three days later, the Holy Spirit, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit three days later, and he was filled. He was alive apart from the law. But somewhere in his early time of being a believer, he thought he had to be sanctified through his service to the Lord, and he started trying to fulfill the commandments of the Lord in his own flesh, and he died. He is now going to be speaking about this period in his early believerhood where he had the same struggle that you and I struggle with. So if you struggle with this, Paul is now going to reveal himself and you're going to see confession after confession of Paul. Where Paul the Apostle struggled with the same thing that you did. So can you imagine this? That the writer of the New, of the, the majority of the New Testament, the one who we are studying the depth of his theology here, is now going to be revealing his own weaknesses. He already revealed some. He says, I was coveting like crazy. 
So when you, you, you know, share your sins, you know, I, I have these lustful thoughts. You're not alone. Paul was sharing his coveting. So in other words, he's coveting of all sorts. One of the things was don't covet your neighbor's wife. So Paul was probably coveting his neighbor's wife. Paul is sharing his struggles. And so he says, he says, uh, uh, I was once alive apart from the law, but the commandment came. So as soon as the commandments came in, sin became alive and I died. He was alive and then he died. This is what happens in the life of the believer. When we think that we're going to start giving our service now to the Lord through our own strength, without the Holy Spirit. And he says, in the commandment which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. He said, sin deceived me and it killed me. This struggle that you have with sin as a believer, you are not alone. This is why I am so open about sharing with my own struggles through my life. Because this is what opens people up to say, wow, you struggled with it? Wow. I look at this and I see Paul struggled with this. And look at how Paul, God used Paul. So maybe God can use me too. That's the whole thing about this. He is revealing about himself his own struggles. He had coveting of all kinds. And then he says, he says, sin deceived me. It's just deceiving in the way it works. And it killed me. But he stresses in verse 12, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The commandments are good. Verse 13, therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Again, no stinking way. No way. The law is great. It's holy and righteous and good. He says, rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin would make me, sin would become utterly sinful. It just showed me how sinful this is. It's The problem is not the law. The problem is what the law had to work with. That's the problem with it. And it says, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56, 1 Corinthians 15, 56, it says, The sting of death, I'm sorry, the sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. The sting of death is sin, the power of sin is the law. The law gives sin a base of operation. Gives it a base of operation. As soon as we start trying to obey God's commandments on our own, we will fail. And that's what this talks about. That's what he's talking about here. And he he starts bringing us into what he's going to present now, this conflict of two natures. That there's this sin in me working. And it did battle with him. So sometime in Paul's life, he went, he became a believer. If you do not know the Lord, I urge you to know the Lord. You've got to talk with me. If you're here and you have never accepted Jesus, you got to come and see me and talk to me. And, and, uh, we'll get you, we, we will close that deal today. If you're listening online, you email me tour at drjamestour.org or uh, yeah, tour at drjamestour.org and I will get with you. We will have a conversation together. You'll get saved that day. You get saved that day. But then what happens is as you try to walk this thing out, this sort of thing may creep in. If you are an unbeliever, you have absolutely no possibility of victory over sin. There's only victory over sin by walking with the Holy Spirit and that's what we're going to learn about in chapter 8. But what Paul's doing is he is revealing something about his own life. So this major apostle is so open about his own life. He's revealing his own weaknesses, the things that happened in his own life. This is what had happened to him. This is the struggle that was going on in his life. But what he's going to then take us into is, beyond this struggle, how he overcame this and how it can be overcome. So that, so that not that you become sinless, in fact, he even teaches against this, but how there can be an overcoming. 
so that we love to serve God just because we learn to love Jesus so much. I love my granddaughter so much. I will serve her. I, you, you know, I'm tired and everything, and they, they, my grandkids want to play hide and seek. And, oh yeah, I really want to do that. Yeah, let's do that. And, you know, you're searching all over the place and, oh, I can't find you as the feet are sticking out from under the bed or something. And, and, but because I love them, I do this. Because I love them, I do this. You end up serving the Lord. You just love Him so much. The whole thing turns to joy. It is a joy of service, a joy even of suffering because you love Him so much. This whole thing of learning to do this because I love my Lord. I don't want to sin because I don't want to bring disappointment to my Lord Jesus. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. You see, the whole difference of this is that you, the whole service comes out of love for the Holy Spirit, love for Jesus. And this is what he's turning us to. He turns the whole thing around. If you do not know the Lord, I urge you to know Him. You cannot have victory over sin without first knowing Him. Come to Jesus today. I will, I will just bring you right through scripture after scripture. Within 30 minutes, you will be saved. If you have been saved and you struggle with sin, you don't have to be resaved. You just have to listen to this teaching. There is victory here. There is victory because salvation is not a sham. There is victory in this. It's just that we've never been really taught. We've never been taught how to have victory over sin. And this is what he's doing. He's teaching us, but he's saying, look guys, this is not a bunch of theoretical and, and, and uh, philosophical and theological mumbo jumbo. This is not for the Bible college. I'm bringing it right down to where it is. Let me tell you about my own life. You wanna know where my struggles are, Paul says? My struggles are in coveting. Not just a little, oh yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Pa- Paul, you, you, you may have seen one big house once and you coveted it for a nanosecond. Paul says, no, 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 no. Every kind of coveting there is, I coveted. He says there was coveting of, he says, uh, um, uh, but sin producing an opportunity through commandment producing me coveting of every kind. You know what every means? It doesn't matter what it was, I coveted it. That's what Paul was saying. Paul says, I am revealing to you the depth of my coveting. I mean, here I was, this Pharisee back then, but then I became a believer and I struggled with this. I had coveting of every kind was filling me. And I had to do battle with this thing. There's coveting of every kind. Everybody has a struggle. You are not alone in this. This is what I'm telling you. You're not alone. I mean, some believers even want to take their life because of this struggle that they have. You're not alone. This is an indication that you are a believer. This is an indication that you are saved. This is an indication that God loves you because of this struggle. Because He's conforming you to the image of His Son and He's taking you through this experience just as Paul went through it. We go through it. And Paul's revealing himself to us, and we're going to even see more of the conflict that was going on in Paul's own life in in, in verses 14 through 25 of this chapter next time. And you're going to see, and you're going to see, wow, this guy is really, this is my life. What he's talking about here, this duality that I have where I talk about God, I want to serve him. And then on the other side, I'm struggling with this sin. Everybody struggles with this. You're not alone. Everybody does. And he gives us victory in this. It's not sinlessness, but it is victory in Jesus Christ. And we'll learn about this. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this word. This word is so good. Blessed be your name, O Lord. Lord, I thank you that the word of God, the Bible, is so real. The Bible is pure holy and righteous, good in every way. And yet, because of us, because of our own sin, we struggle with these things. Father, I pray for these young people that even through this teaching, that you would give them victory. That you would give them victory. Lord, I pray that you would encourage them. 
that as they struggle within themselves and see this duality struggling within them, that they would see that this is common even to the Apostle Paul. Father, I pray that you draw them to Jesus Christ. Draw them. Let your work in their life be real. Draw them to Jesus, O Lord, for the glory of Jesus. And Father, for those who do not know you, Father, I pray that you give me an opportunity to speak with them, that they would reach out to me and that I would have this opportunity to share with them one-on-one. Lord, open up that, that process, I pray, for the glory of Jesus and in his name. Amen.